All right, what's going on guys? Welcome back to the BTB Fitness Podcast and welcome back to the YouTube channel. Uh, you'll see that I have Zuki with me today. Uh, I don't think she's been with me uh, the past, I think, two uh, podcast episodes. She hasn't been sitting here with me, uh, but she is uh, today. This is pretty typical. Uh, she's she's quite the cuddle bug and uh, I love it. She's she's the best. So I um, hope you guys are doing good since the uh, the last episode um, of the the podcast. Um, we got a pretty fun episode today. This is one that I'm actually really excited um, to do. Uh, the, the, the thought to do this just kind of popped in my head um, out of nowhere. Uh, and I thought, man, this would be a really cool uh, video to make. So uh, today we're going to be discussing five things that I wish that I knew when I first started training. So um, I've been training for um, probably five years now, bodybuilding style. Um, I have been in the gym for probably eight or nine years uh, of my total life. I had uh, four or five years, uh, probably four years um, of like Olympic style, um, lifting for football and all that type of stuff when I was in high school, uh, and just sports in general. Um, and then after high school, kind of getting into more bodybuilding training, uh, I've been doing that for about five years now. So, um, you know, there are, are a couple of things that I really wish that I had known, uh, when I first started training. And I thought that it would be cool, uh, just to kind of talk over some of those. Uh, I'm very aware um, from a lot of my uh, TikTok comments and uh, Instagram DMs and stuff that I do have a lot of people who are younger uh, and, and just getting started in the gym uh, who watch my content. So I, I thought that this would be a really fun uh, video to make for you guys. Uh, my goal with this video is, you know, for someone to, to take something from this and uh, maybe kind of uh, get on a, a more straight path sooner. You know, I don't, I don't want to say that the things that I do uh, by any means are the only way to do things, but, um, you know, there's just some things that I see uh, are, are real common mistakes that beginners make and, and mistakes that I made when I was a beginner. Uh, and so it would be really cool to see if I can, you know, kind of go over some of those things and, um, uh, and kind of highlight some of those. Uh, and obviously, you know, the fun part of this video is that there may be people who have been training for a long time who uh, maybe they just knew these things and they forgot and, and needed a refresher uh, or something. But uh, I think that this uh, video in general is going to be applicable to, to everybody. Hopefully, you know, regardless of your training uh, experience and age and everything, that there's something in here uh, that you can learn. So um, we'll just kind of go ahead and get right into it. So uh, the first thing that I wish that I knew when I first started training was less is more. And this has to do um, both with training volume, training frequency, um, days in the gym, just, just overall uh, workload uh, in the gym. So um, when I first started um, bodybuilding training, um, the people who I was gathering my, uh, I guess, information on, you know, when you're a beginner and you really don't know anything, you, you kind of just take matters into your own hands and you YouTube uh, workouts and, and, and stuff like that. And then you just go to the gym uh, and you try it. And that's very much how I spent uh, the first year uh, at least uh, of being in the gym. And, and that obviously still continues to this day. There will still be people uh, whose content I watch to kind of learn from and stuff. But um, I, I'm not actively seeking like new ways to do things, if that makes sense. When, when you're a beginner and you literally know nothing, you're like, I, I just need to learn something so that I can do something. The people who I were watching um, were a lot of like, I, I, I guess you could uh, call them like stereotypical, like pump bodybuilders and stuff like Arnold, um, Callum Von Moger at the time. Um, who else? Those are really kind of the two people who I was watching the most. Rich Piana, um, people like that, you know, who, um, you know, obviously no, <laughs> no, uh, like disrespect or anything towards them, but th their methodologies on training are basically just like go in and do a lot of work and, uh, drop set everything and, and, and all of that type of stuff. So, um, that was what I was under the impression that I needed to do, uh, right away from the, from the get go. And, and when I started training, um, I was training, uh, six, seven days per week that eventually transitioned into a point where, um, I was training five days per week, um, for like the, the first, I would say the first, um, like year or two that I was in the gym, I was training six or seven days per week. And then there eventually got to a point where I, I kind of transitioned to start to take it more seriously. 
um, and, uh, and, and that process has been going on for the past like five years. So I, I just kind of want to uh, make that clear. I've been in the gym like doing bodybuilding training for like six to seven years, but I don't know if I really count the first two because it was just kind of um, fluff nonsense. But when I, when I got to the point where I started taking it more seriously, I was following a bro split and I was training Monday through Friday. At the time, I was going to school and I was working a full-time job um, and my girlfriend was living out where we currently live right now and I was still living back in my hometown, which is about two hours or so away from, uh, from where we are right now and, and my girlfriend was living out here. So um, I, I was very busy during the week. I was working every other weekend and then on the week weekends where I wasn't working, uh, my girlfriend was either coming out to stay with me or I was coming out here to stay with her. Uh, so I was training Monday through Friday, but I was training five days in a row and I was training with a bro split. I was training um, chest. Um, I don't remember the order, but it was a chest day, a back day, a shoulder day, um, a quad day, and a hamstring day. I did not have an arm day. I had my arm work uh, spread throughout the, the chest and, um, and back days. But it was just high volume everything, um, drop set everything, like lots of, of pump style work. Um, and, and one of the, you know, the issues uh, with that, uh, and, and I've kind of talked about this before on one of, uh, one of my videos. I have a, uh, a podcast episode uh, slash YouTube video, depending on what you're watching or listening to this too, um, where I, I titled it, Which Split is the Best for You? Um, and in that split, I kind of talk about this a little more, or in that video, I kind of talk about this in, in a little more um, specificity. But when you're someone who is a beginner, you don't need a, a large amount of work uh, in order to elicit a, a novel stimulus because you're a beginner and, and the overall concept of training is new to you. So you don't need to, uh, you know, pound yourself with set after set after set after set. You can do a relatively small amount of work and, and be able to uh, recover and progress from that and grow from that because you're, uh, you're a new trainee. And so if you're interested in kind of hearing more about that, then you can go check out that video. Um, but obviously uh, that is a huge issue with kind of getting into the higher volume um, stuff early on uh, is that you kind of don't really take advantage of the fact that you could be doing very little workload and uh, milking out like super easy gains um, during that phase just by uh, doing a relatively small amount of work. I mean, I think that people would, would really be surprised as to how little work that they could do and still make progress as, uh, as a beginner. So it kind of just seems wasteful to not take advantage um, of that opportunity. Obviously, hindsight is twenty twenty, and that's kind of, you know, the overall theme of this whole video is that it's, it's too late to know those things. And, and if we had known those things, if I had known those things back in the day, then uh, maybe I'd be a completely different bodybuilder today. But um, that's kind of the point, uh, you know, is to kind of learn um, from the mistakes. But uh, I, I just really feel like I could have taken more advantage um, of that time period. What I, I really should have done, you know, if I kind of go back and I think about it, what would have been the most appropriate way um, to do that. What I really should have done is uh, continued with taking the weekends off. Obviously at the time that was not really negotiable for me. I was working like pretty much all day on Saturday and Sunday uh, on the weekends at that time because uh, I wasn't working a lot of hours Monday through Friday because I was a full-time college student. So I was just trying to make money on the weekends. And then on the other weekends, I was spending that with my girlfriend. So Monday through Friday was really all the time that I had available to me. What I should have done uh, was d done either like a full body split Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or an upper lower split like Monday, Tuesday, take Wednesday off in the middle of the week, and then Thursday, Friday. Um, and relatively low volume in each of those sessions, obviously still training really hard and training to failure, but um, just focusing on maybe doing one, maybe two sets uh, on an exercise and then coming in. Uh, the next week and, and beating the, uh, those numbers. If, if you're a client of mine who is listening to this video um, and you're a younger client, you know, 16, 17, 15, 16, 17, you know, however young, uh, this, the split that I just described to you guys may sound very familiar um, to you guys because I, I truly feel um, for a lot of people in that age group uh, that that is an appropriate split that, that they could and should be using. Uh, because it just really allows them to kind of nail the basics down, um, focus on really what matters is, is progressing your lifts and uh, not so much the volume and everything in which you're doing that, just progress your lifts and get stronger. Um, 
and rest and, and recovery. Uh, I would have been training in the full body scenario. I would have been training three days per week. And in the upper body split, I would have been training four days per week. And, and that would have just been um, so much easier mentally and physically for me uh, to do. Cause you know, by the end, even as a beginner, by the end of that five days in a row, man, like I was really tired. It was really hard for me to get through those sessions. And I was really struggling, um, with progressing my lifts a lot of the time. Uh, and, and that's something that we'll talk about uh, in another one of these mistakes is, um, I, I was following a lot of the same principles that I, I currently follow, but I was just running into plateaus and stuff so frequently and so quickly. And I was like, man, like I get like a couple of weeks of, of progress in the gym and then like it all goes to, to shit. And um, this was definitely one of the reasons why that happened is because I was just doing way too much, uh, more than I could recover from. Um, and it just led to uh, uh, plateaus eventually. So I, like I, I write in the last point here, I could have gotten away with much less work and made much better progress and gotten much stronger, much quicker. Um, if I had followed uh, the full body split or the, the upper lower split during that time period. But uh, less, less is more, and that still is the case um, for me today. I, I really am trying to do the least amount of work in the gym that I can do in order to get the job done uh, and, and focusing on high quality output um, and then recovering and then coming in and beating uh, the numbers on that every single week. I think that that's uh, a, a much more hypertrophic environment uh, than doing a lot of unnecessary uh, high volume workouts. Okay, thing number two that I wish that I knew when I was a beginner was not to be afraid of food. So I've talked about my personal um, like fitness history on, on my YouTube channel before, uh, TikTok, all of it. I, I've kind of you know been a fairly open book. Uh, I feel like up until this point, but. My um, like transition of getting into the gym was being from an overweight person and losing a large amount of weight. So I was about 255, 260 pounds at my heaviest. Um, I joined the gym in January of 20, I don't even remember the year at this point, 16, 15 or 16, one of those years I, I literally don't even remember. Um, and... And over the course of that first year, I lost over 100 pounds. At my lightest, I was 152 pounds. Um, and I lost over 100 pounds in a year. Um, and I was very lean uh, and very skinny. And I was absolutely petrified of eating more food uh, and putting on more body fat. I had worked so hard to get that lean. Um, and it, I just was so worried about eating food and gaining weight and, and, and putting on body fat. And, and I just had a real bad relationship uh, with food in, in my early years um, of training. Um, my first few bulking phases were very, very slow and unproductive because I was too scared to push the food. There were plenty of times where I could have and should have continued to eat more food and pushed my calories higher, but I talked myself out of it because I would make up scenarios like, oh, you know, let's just hold calories here for a week and see what happens again uh, or something like that. Basically procrastinating the process uh, of increasing calories and putting on body fat. And what that led to is my first couple bulking phases failing and not really getting anything out of it other than uh, just getting a little bit softer, um, wasn't really getting uh, a lot stronger. Um, and then as soon as I put on like, uh, you know, any sort of uh, amount of body fat, uh, I would kind of panic and then do like a mini cut uh, and clean it up. And, uh, and, and, I, and I was just overall so scared uh, of eating food uh, and, and putting on body fat. Uh, and, and this is an unbelievably common uh, scenario that I, uh, I get in my TikTok comments and my Instagram DMs uh, and, and even with clients too. I get a lot of clients who uh, will come to me and, and one of the main reasons they come to me is because they want to do a bulk but they're, they're literally scared to do it on their own because they, they have tried it before and they failed. Uh, they are afraid to fail uh, and, and this is just an unbelievably common um, thing that I see. And not only do I see it on a daily basis, I've, I've lived it myself uh, and I've experienced it. And, and when I just think back of how much better I could have been 
and how much stronger I could have been if I had just allowed myself to eat more food and put on more body fat and gotten okay uh, with the body fat and, and learning to deal with it. Uh, because I think that's kind of like the root cause of this is, uh, you know, isn't necessarily uh, the fact of eating more food. It's, it's the psychological fear of putting on body fat and having a negative association with body fat. That's a different video for a different day. But um, that really is kind of the root cause of, of, of this. Uh, and, and that held me back so much uh, my first couple of years. And I see a lot of people, like I said, in, in my comments and DMs and stuff, who it, it has held back and continues to hold back. Um, so I, I really feel a particular need to address this one uh, in particular. Um, as I write, I, I should have been much more assertive with my bulks and then just dealt with the fat as it had accumulated. This really is the secret to it. A lot of you guys, if you would just commit to a bulk, and be mentally okay with putting on the body fat that you get during the bulking phase, if, if you could just continue to trust that process and just continue to push through, and then, you know, six, eight, 10, 12 months down the road, you do a cut and you clean up some of that body fat that you put on, you would, you would know and experience what I'm talking about right now because you would, you would understand, yes, I put on body fat this year, but like I also got a lot bigger and stronger this year. And, and you would understand that this is part of the process and, and this is something that needs uh, to be done. What I write here is that main gaining is a myth. Uh, and, you know, there's obviously inevitably going to be somebody who loses their marbles at that in the comments section. But um, I'll say this. Maybe, maybe it's not a myth. It, it, it does happen. But it happens to a very, very small percentage of people. And the percentage of people that it happens to, it only happens for a short period of time. It's not something that you're going to be able to consistently trust will work for you year after year after year after year. I've been training for six, seven years. No one in my position is main gaining. Beginners may pull off a main gaining phase. Someone who has been injured for a long period of time and is just coming back to the gym, they may be able to pull off a, a main gaining phase. Someone who's detrained, but 98% of the people who are listening to this video uh, will not be able to, to do a main gaining phase and successfully um, pull it off. Um, and if it is, you know, statistically they get something out of it, they would just straight up have gained way more muscle if they had just committed uh, to eating more food. That was a mistake that I see a lot of people make. It's a mistake that I made myself uh, when I first started. Um, and, and I really, really wish that I could go back in time uh, and change this one and have been a little bit more assertive with this one. All right, the third thing that I could go back and change uh, was uh, to remind myself that I don't have to barbell, bench, squat, and deadlift. Uh, so this is another super common one that I see in the comment section and I see in the, um, uh, in the Instagram DMs. Uh, I, I spent a long period of time barbell squatting, benching, and deadlifting and because I was under the impression that I had to. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I, I started being in the gym in eighth grade and so I would have been, I would have been 13 uh, in eighth grade. Uh, and I have five years of Olympic lifting slash CrossFit experience before I even did a single set uh, of bodybuilding work. Uh, and in uh, Olympic lifting, obviously the, the barbell is everything. There, there's barbell only lifts. Uh, so I, I did a lot of barbell. So I would do, we barbell squatted, whether it was overhead squatting, front squatting, back squat, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we squatted every single day. I have a lot of experience with uh, barbell squatting, benching, and deadlifting. And obviously, if you're a power lifter, these are non-negotiables. Um, if you're an Olympic lifter, uh, you know, obviously, you know, um, traditional bench squat and dead and stuff are not, uh, you know, your competition lifts, but you do them uh, within an Olympic lifting program at some point. Uh, and obviously, uh, we were training for football too, so they had their purpose for that, but... There are still a lot of people who are under the impression that bodybuilders need to be doing barbell um, be uh, benches, uh, deadlifts, and squats. Uh, and, and I don't want to turn this into a video in terms of like comparing um, whether, you know, machines to, to barbells and all of this type of stuff. That's a completely different video uh, on a different day. Um, basically, what I'll say is that if you do these exercises and they don't cause injuries for you and you get good growth in the target musculature from them, 
Um, I think they're great. Uh, but the reality of the situation is that I, I, I don't want to say majority of people. I would say maybe like six out of every 10 uh, people uh, in the world. So technically the majority, but not by much. Uh, there's a really large percentage of people out there that can't really do these movements comfortably. Um, and uh, they, they just cause injuries for them. And, and they're just not great um, exercises uh, for hypertrophic um, benefits. Um, I believe that I fall into this category. Um, I've, I developed shoulder issues over and over again from the bench press. Every time I would build my bench press up to a certain weight, like when I got to the point where I was doing like 235, uh, 240, 245 for like sets of five and six, I would always get a, a shoulder issue problem that I still kind of deal with on and on from this day. Um, and I've got uh, a lot of um, lower back issues from, uh, from deadlift. Uh, I suffered a, you know, it, it wasn't, God forbid, it wasn't a major lower back injury, but uh, I had a lower back injury that um, disrupted my training for a significant period of time, um, quite significantly um, from deadlifting, attempting a one rep max, uh, of course, which is um, ridiculous, but even working in hypertrophic friendly rep ranges, there's just something about the way that my body moves and everything is it just doesn't really get along with um with uh with barbell deadlifts i don't hate barbell squats but what i really notice is i got a lot of glute growth from them and i didn't really get a lot of quad growth i think that has to do with my ankle uh mobility a lot i've uh i have a lot of uh, ankle injuries uh from my years of playing football um, which has kind of like led me to have really poor ankle mobility it's improving i'm, I'm making progress on it but it still isn't really that great uh, and so uh, a, a barbell squat is not the best exercise for me uh, to be able to really bias uh, my quads a whole lot. And then it also, uh, from past experience, once I get to a certain weight, it will always aggravate my lower back uh, with that. So after uh, you know running those exercises for a long period of time, my first two and a half years of training in the gym, uh, I, I trained at a YMCA. I had very, very basic equipment. So I, I, I kind of had to do those exercises. <clears throat> when I moved out to the suburbs of Chicago, which is where I live now, um, now I live in an area that has a lot of um, nice gyms that have a lot of nice equipment. Uh, and I was exposed to a lot of that stuff finally. Uh, and, and I realized pretty quickly, like, man, if I do this hack squat instead of this barbell squat, my back feels better. Uh, my quads are growing. Uh, and it's easier to stabilize and, and it's just uh, a much better exercise to do. Same thing with a lot of the machine chest presses and the barbell bench and everything. Shoulders felt good, pecs felt better. Um, and then I, when I moved out here, I really started to transition more into RDLs. And I really prefer the RDL to the, uh, to the traditional deadlift um, for a hypertrophic uh, hip hinge uh, movement. So I've basically exclusively done those um, and the occasional stiff leg block um, here and there since I've moved out here. But I wish that I could go back in time and remind myself of that earlier. Uh, I could have done more dumbbell work. Um, we didn't have a lot of machines in the gym that I grew up in, but we had some. Uh, I could have made those work. I could have done cable exercises. If I had known what I know now, then I would have been able to make it work. But um, I, I really was super stubborn uh, on doing the barbell squat bench and deadlift for a long time. Uh, and I really don't think that that was necessary. Now I will say this. If you are a beginner, I do think that you do need to dedicate, man, at least like one to three years of doing barbell squatting, benching, and deadlifting uh, in order to make sure that they're not good exercises for you. And also a lot of the movement patterns that you develop from those exercises, you can carry over into dumbbell and, and machine and, uh, and hack squat and all of that type of stuff. So I, I do strongly believe that learning how to move under a barbell in free space is, is a very important thing for uh, beginners uh, to be able um, to do. And I haven't completely written off the idea of going back at some point in the future and trying these exercises again. Because even though like, you know, there's a part of me that's like, okay, these are not, uh, you know, good exercises for me. There's also a part of me that wants to challenge myself to get good at those. So I haven't completely written that off, 
but there are a lot of people who never even give them a chance and write them off from the very beginning because they hear from some social media influencer that this particular influencer doesn't do them and so they think okay i i don't need to do them either and uh, the only reason why i know they don't work for me is because i've dedicated five to six years uh, of doing them and and knowing that at, at a certain point they don't work for me anymore but a lot of people listening to this video will not have invested uh, that amount of time. I, like I said, I don't think that I need uh, to have invested five to six years, but I do think a lot of you people who are listening to this video, if you haven't done this, you need to, man, I, I would even say, I would say two to three years. I think one year, like a lot of people will be spending that first year just learning how to move. Uh, and it'll kind of take them a year to get fully comfortable uh, with, with doing like proper benching, squatting, and deadlifting. Obviously, it depends if you work with a coach, if, if you're someone who picks up on skills quickly. Obviously, there's uh, individual uh, differences in there, but uh, you know, just having to guess the vast majority, it's going to take you some time to get familiar with those exercises, um, but then you need to actually spend time and develop them, get stronger at them, get better on your execution. Uh, don't be so quick to, to, to dump them right away. Okay, the fourth thing that I wish that I could change is understanding that deloading is necessary and I should have deloaded uh, much more frequently than, than what I did. I never used to deload. Uh, I thought that deloading uh, was stupid. Um, I, you know, I, I was kind of like young and, and new to training and I just, I, I didn't really understand the concept of needing to pull back to allow the body to recover so that it can uh, keep pushing. Again, remember, a lot of the people um, who I was getting my information from when I first started training uh, were guys who are like pump bodybuilders and pump bodybuilders don't deload, man. They, they go to the gym five to six days a week and they pump everything up and, uh, and that's it. You know what I mean? They never talk about tracking performance and any of that stuff, let alone deloading uh, or any of that stuff. So um, it, it wasn't even a thought that really occurred to me. Um, and when, when I was kind of introduced to the idea um, I, it just didn't really make sense to me. And so I didn't really apply it, honestly. Um, and one of the things that I mentioned earlier was I was running into plateaus all the time. Uh, and, and this is definitely, uh, contributing with the fact that I was definitely overtraining in the amount that I was, uh, was doing. Um, maybe if I had even deloaded during that bro split Monday through Friday split, then maybe it would have been better, but, uh, I, I wasn't doing that. So, um, I, I would always hit plateaus. Um, like almost all of my lifts, I knew like there's going to be a certain point where like once I hit this certain weight, I'm not going to be able to progress it anymore. <laughs> you know, I would do like a, a barbell overhead press and I would do like 165. I would get up to like 165 for like five or six reps and then I could never beat that. So then I would swap it out with a dumbbell press and then the dumbbell press was like I could do the 90s for five or six. And then once I got to doing the 90s for five or six, it would never, you know, progress past that. And then I would go back to the barbell press and I would start at like 145 or something and like uh, restart my form. And every single time without fail, I would get to that 165 uh, and, and, and stall. And, and that was just one exercise. Like literally all of my major compound exercises were like that is I had a certain like level of strength that I would get to. And once I got there, I would never break past that. And I, uh, amongst other things, one of the reasons why that happened is because I just wasn't deloading. And then I'm getting surprised why I'm hitting strength plateaus and I'm never, uh, never getting stronger. And typically what would happen is I would have to take deloads um, by, uh, by force. I would get sick. I would, I would have overtrained so much and uh, never have taken time off and never have rested that I would get sick. And actually one of those times I ended up getting mono, uh, which was a, an absolutely horrible feeling. I mean, anybody who's gotten mono will be able to attest that it's just like, it, it's fucking hell. I mean, it just like saps all of the energy from you and, and, and it's, it's terrible. Really, really sucks. And that was a really big, like eye opening experience to me. 
at that point, I was like, I was very aware of the fact that I would, I would train, uh, I would, you know, get stronger, stronger, stronger. I would hit a plateau. Uh, and then after a week or two of trying to break that plateau, I would get sick. That was a cycle that I was starting to, to notice was occurring. And then finally, one of those times through that cycle, the sickness was mono and it was not, not severe, like life threatening, but I was like out of commission for like two weeks. And I was like, dude, this is awful. Uh, I am doing this to myself because I'm, I'm just pushing, 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 and, and I'm never allowing myself to recover. Um, so I, I definitely should have deloaded more frequently. What I should have done uh, and, and would have done is like schedule the deload at first, um, maybe every six to 10 weeks, somewhere in there, um, and then just assess whether I thought that was needed. That's a really, that's a really good um, uh, like tip of advice that I could give beginners who are listening to this now. <laughs> Eventually, like when you get into my position, like uh, deloads are something that are auto-regulated. I, I don't schedule when I take a deload. I just take a deload when my body tells me I need uh, to take one. But I've been training for a long period of time and I know how to read my body and I know the signs that my body gives me when it's time to take a deload. Beginners won't be able to read their body's feedback like that. And so what I would do is I would I would schedule them. And, and maybe you start off scheduling them every six weeks. And then what I would do is I would take a deload every six weeks and then at the end of, of that deload, kind of like take a step back and self-assess and ask yourself, okay, do I feel like a lot better, um, like more energetic and, and more like uh, stronger in the gym after taking a, a deload around the six week mark? And, 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 you know, you'll be able to, to notice like trends over time. You'll be able to notice like, okay, I've done like three or four deloads now. Each one has been uh, around the six week mark. And I, I really feel like I could maybe do another week of training before I need to deload. So then maybe you try to schedule the deloads every seven weeks and see if you can get uh, away with that and, and, and just repeat that process. You know, it's, it's not a sexy answer, but it's just like, it's a giant game of guess and check. It's, it's a giant game of, of uh, coming up with a plan, executing that plan, and assessing whether or not uh, you can push longer, uh, whether you need to deload more frequently. Um, it, it, it's just a giant game uh, of guess and check. But when you're not deloading at all, uh, don't be surprised when you hit a, a performance plateau, and that's exactly um, what I did. So if, if I could go back in time, uh, I would have scheduled them probably around you know every six to eight weeks, and I would have assessed them uh, every single time to see uh, if it was a good call or not. Okay, the fifth thing that I wish that I could go back and change is understanding that I did not have to get shredded uh, before I started a bulking phase. This is another uh, just unbelievably common one that I see in the, uh, in the Instagram uh, messages and, and, and TikTok comments is um, people are, are familiar uh, with the concept that you bulk until you get to a, you know, uh, a point where you're too fat uh, and then you diet again uh, so that you can get leaner so that you can start the next bulk. People are pretty familiar with that concept, but the issue with it is, is that people think that their cut has to be like all, they have to get all of their fat off before that they can start um, a bulk. And that's just like completely, completely unnecessary and leads to a lot of wasted time. And I actually feel like it sets you back in the long run. Uh, and, and I'll talk about that in a second here, but Let's just kind of take uh, a hypothetical scenario. I'm going to work in like even numbers so it's easy to understand. Let's say that we have a person who is 200 pounds and they're 25% body fat. So let's, you know, do some simple math. 25% of 200 is 50 pounds. So this person is 200 pounds and they have 50 pounds um, of body fat. So if we were to snap our fingers and, and just remove every single pound of body fat off this individual, they would be 150 pounds, okay? So just keep that number in your head, 150 pounds. Let's say this 200 pound individual wants to start a, a cut and they, they just finished a bulk, they wanna clean up some body fat before they start their next bulk. That person could probably cut to 175, 180 pounds uh, and, and get themselves in a really good position where they can start a bulk from 175, 180 um, and, and start making progress at that point. 
However, a lot of people would be under the pressure that they need to diet themselves like all the way down to 160 and like get to that point where they're like super duper lean. Remember, this person at 150 pounds has no fat on their body. So at 160 pounds, um, they have 10 pounds of fat on their body. And, and you know, I, I'm not going to do the math off the top of my head, but uh, 10 pounds of body fat on a 160 pound body is a very, very low body fat percentage. I mean, it, it's under 10% for sure. Uh, and, and people are under the impression that that's the point that they need to get to before they can even start the bulk. And that's just a completely ridiculous uh, theory and, and just completely uh, nonsensical. Um, the, the, the person in this particular scenario could have dieted to 175 uh, and, and been as lean as they need to get to be able to experience all of the, uh, the benefits of, of increased insulin resistance, um, gaining themselves like some runway to gain weight and, and, and get stronger. Um, they're going to feel better because they've gotten rid of like 25 pounds uh, of junk weight and everything and, and just overall quality of life is going to improve. Now, if that person like continues to diet from that 175 range, they're eventually going to get to a point where they're going to get really, really lean. And then continuing to get even leaner from that point is going to require more cardio or more steps and or less food. That person is going to notice their energy levels go to complete shit. Their libido and sex drive go to uh, complete shit, which indicates their testosterone levels are going to complete shit. Um, their training performance goes to complete shit. There eventually comes a certain point where you reach a certain body fat percentage where like there are no more, there are no longer positive things that are happening. Your quality of life is just continuing to get worse and worse and worse. Your hormones are getting lower and lower and lower and getting more and more skewed. And yet there are still people who are on the internet, who are still going to say, you know, the leaner that you get, the more anabolic that you are in, because the, the leaner that you are, the more likely your body is, is to put on muscle mass. Bullshit. Show me somebody who is seven, eight percent body fat. And uh, unless they're using anabolics, their testosterone is fucked. Their energy is fucked. Their libido is fucked. Their gym performance is fucked. Like you're going to tell me that a person in that environment is in a prime position to put on muscle. Absolutely not. A person in that position has actually done themselves a disservice in terms of putting on muscle mass because they have dieted so far and so hard that they've actually like degraded their quality of life and degraded uh, their their overall hormonal environment and degraded um, their their appetite uh, hormonaling. It, it, it's all messed up. So um, yes, we do need to get leaner and we do need to lose body fat just to kind of like reset and resensitize the body to get, uh, to get gaining, but we don't have to get peeled out of our mind before we can start a gaining phase. And I actually think that that sets uh, a lot of people back with that mentality is because uh, l let's take the scenario that I gave. The person starts at 200 pounds and they diet to 175. Let's say that takes... 25 pounds. Let's, let's just say that takes like six months, one pound a week. That would be 24 weeks or whatever. Let's say that takes six months. I think that person, if they just got more aggressive, could do it in four months, but let's just keep it simple and say it takes six months. Now that same person to go from 175, then to go to 160, that's another 15 pounds. Let's say that takes them another 15 uh, to 16 weeks. Let's say that takes them another four months. They could have cut the diet off at 175 and started a bulk from there, but instead they continued to diet for another 15 weeks or another four months uh, and, and just put themselves in an even worse environment uh, to gain muscle mass. Uh, and that four months of time that they spent going from 175 to 160 is all wasted time that they could get back. And they're actually going to end up wasting more than four months because, as I mentioned, like they got themselves into a really uh, shitty quality of life situation to where now their body is no longer primed to, to put on uh, good amounts of muscle. 
and it's going to take maybe another month or two to get their body out of that position. And so basically what they've done is, is they've taken away uh, six months of time that they could uh, have been growing because they've been under the impression that they need to get uh, super physiologically lean uh, in order to bulk and it's just uh, completely ridiculous. The only time that you should ever get that lean is if you're going to be competing or if you're like a model and you're making income off of your physique. But uh, it, it really kind of gets pretty frustrating to me like how many normal average everyday people are getting just like unbelievably shredded because they're under the impression that that's what they need to do in order to bulk and and it's just like you're ruining your quality of life for for nothing so uh, that's that's a different rant for uh for a different day but i don't know i feel like i covered it pretty uh pretty good there so Anyways, so basically you could save yourself uh, a lot of time and uh, there may be people who are listening this, to this video right now and they're like, okay, well, like I extended the, you know, the, the duration of my, my cut an extra three months or four months, like who cares? If you do that every single year, like that time is, is going to add up. You know what I mean? If, if, if you're making your cut three months longer than it needs to be every single year, uh, you know, that's going to add up, you know, every four years is a year's worth uh, of wasted time. You're basically worth tw wasting 25% uh, uh, of the time that, uh, that you could uh, be growing. And, and, and that is pretty significant because this is, you know, another topic for a different day. But in, in order to make real progress in bodybuilding, this is something that you have to at least commit five to ten years to. So if, if that's a mistake that you're going to be making every year, yeah, you know, an extra three months of wasted time every year may not seem like a huge deal, but that's going to accumulate and multiply and amplify as your uh, training journey or your training career continues. So uh, I think it's pretty important to, uh, to nip that in the bud uh, early on. Uh, as I uh, write here all the time that could be that is spent in a deficit is is wasted time for growth. Uh, another video or another you know controversial topic that likes to get people stirred up is when I say that you're probably not building muscle in a deficit. Basically the same thoughts as the main gaining. I mean maybe two out of every 100 people uh, are able to do it, but like someone in my position, that's not happening. So uh, we should really be trying to minimize the amount of time during the year that we're in a deficit, because if we're in a deficit, we're probably not growing. Uh, and the sport is called bodybuilding. It's about getting bigger and, and getting better, uh, not staying the same because I, I want to stay shredded. Uh, and, and I should have stayed softer uh, and bulked more often. Um, and, uh, and, and just used a traditional like mini cut phase more frequently. But, uh, basically every time I went into a fat loss phase, I was like, okay, like this is a fat loss phase where I got to get peeled out of my mind. And that's just not the case that it needs to be. It, it just makes the cut like psychologically more stressful. And it also like just destroys your body. Anyone, like I I, you know, I ranted about it earlier in the video, but anybody who's listening to this right now who has gotten super, super lean will be able to attest to the fact that at a certain point, it's just like, you feel like fucking shit. And when you feel like that all the time, no matter what anybody tells you, how the leaner that you can get, the more anabolic your body position is in to be able to grow, that's not fucking true. It's just not. All right, guys, thank you so much for taking the time to watch uh, or listen to this video today as uh, usual. Uh, pretty long, but uh, that's what I like to use a podcast for, man, is to, is to just ramble and kind of talk about some things in more, uh, in more depth and stuff. So um, as always, if you guys have any questions or anything on the topic that we covered today, uh, please feel free to leave them in the comment section uh, and I will reply to you guys ASAP. Um, if you guys have any suggestions uh, for other videos that you want to see, uh, you know, with this type of, uh, I guess, setup, more of like a lecture style, longer form content, uh, please let me know because I, I've got plenty of ideas uh, for stuff to make, but uh, I'm also very intrigued uh, to, to make what you guys want to see. So uh, please help me out with that. Um, and then if any of you guys are interested in online coaching, uh, then I have uh, a link to the application in the description uh, of the, the podcast page or the YouTube channel, whatever you're watching or listening to this on. Um, otherwise, you can head to my website, which is btbtraining.net, B as in boy, T as in Tom, B is in boy training dot net slash services and you can see uh, all of my services there. I've got my online uh, monthly coaching. Uh, I've got consultations. I've got training programs, nutrition programs, all that stuff. So uh, if you guys are interested in that, then you can go check that out. But um, otherwise, uh, again, just want to thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, and as always, guys, take care of yourselves. Have a good rest of your day.